thanks everybody for coming. Uh, for any guests that we have, uh, I'm uh, Scott Klinker. I head the 3D design program here, and thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for coming out in the cold. And uh, we have a, a really special event tonight. It's the annual um, Noel Lecture on Design. Oh, I'm sorry. I must have, okay. <laughs> I touched something. Uh, we have the, the annual Noel Lecture on uh, Design. Uh, first, I want to just say a few things about, um, about this lecture before I introduced, introduce our guest. The Noel Lecture on Design was established in 2004 to present a prominent designer at the Academy through a public lecture and a visit with students in the 3D um, design department. Noel is recognized internationally as a manufacturer of workplace furnishings and a leader in sustainable design. Noel is the recipient of the uh, 2011 National Design Award for Corporate Achievement from the Cooper Hewitt uh, National Design Museum. Noel has its roots at Cranbrook. Florence Noel, co-founder of the company uh, with her husband Hans Noel, studied at both uh, Kingswood School and Cranbrook Academy of Art. An impressive list of Cranbrook designers have worked with Noel, including Aero Saarinen, Harry Bertoya, Ralph Rapson, Marianne Strangel, Michael McCoy, Hani Rashid, and most recently, Masamichi Utagawa of Antenna Design, um, a 1991 Academy graduate. On behalf of the Academy, I want to thank Noel for keeping a strong connection with Cranbrook and for providing this opportunity um, to bring top designers here to give a public talk and to speak with our students. So before I introduce our speaker, why don't we thank Noel for their support. One of my personally favorite aspects of the annual Noel Lecture is that it gives me a chance to invite and meet the designers behind the contemporary work that I admire the most. In the recent past, this has allowed us to bring design icons like Teo Remy, Max Lamb, Martino Gamper, Yerzy Seymour, and Bertrand Pott to Cranbrook. Tonight, we are honored to host designer Lindsay Adelman and to add her her name uh, to that list of important voices that are helping to shape our contemporary design culture. We're also excited to add a woman's name to our list of Knoll lecture speakers. I'm sure Florence Knoll would approve. Lindsay Adelman is one of the most inspiring in examples I've encountered of a designer building their dream practice. In talking with her last night, I've learned that this has come about not by luck and not by talent alone, but as a result of clear and intense focus in building her body of work and finding a specific context for it. Along the way, she seems to have seamlessly integrated artistic thinking with logistics of making and selling and managing a talented team of creative people who support her vision. She is a graduate of RISD, where she studied industrial design, and she started her practice in New York in 2006. Her work has been exhibited and, and installed around the world, and she's won too many awards to enumerate here. Her work reflects an ongoing interest in combining the handcrafted with the machine made, the sensual with the practical, and the feminine with the mas masculine. She's been generous enough to take time away from her busy practice to visit us here in Michigan, and hopefully she's not too talked out because she spent the whole day uh, with the, with the um, students in the studio doing what she called speed dating uh, through, the, through the studio, doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, reviews. Um, so we're, we're really great, grateful for you for, um, for doing that today, and I want to thank her for coming, and please help me to welcome designer Lindsay Adelman. Thank you. Um, it was a really fun day, and I'm glad so many of you are here because I feel like we got into s the beginnings of some really interesting conversations that you asked me about my work, um, some that I had never been asked, and so I'm hoping that I can um, present my work, and then I really invite questions because um, your questions today were really well prepared. So um, I'm starting with work that I'm currently involved in and what's really currently moving me and motivating me, and then I'll go back to give you a little bit of what led me to that, so about 15 years and five slides, <laughs> and then I'll move on to show the body of work and a little bit of the story behind some of the pieces that you um, may have seen before. 
So this slide represents a music video that I shot last summer. And um, unlike a couple of people that I talked to today, I've sort of gone from the opposite of industrial design in a really traditional way of um, learning and learning it and then practicing it and pushing myself to set design and create work in an entirely different way, but in a nice, quick way to get the idea out and create the whole environment. And so um, myself and people from my team, I have 26 people in my studio now, and they come from all different backgrounds. And some of them um, are musicians, and some of them um, are vocalists. And so the musician wrote the track, and we recorded it professionally, and then um, Laura worked with me as a consultant and I heard her voice out one night at karaoke and so I said we need to do something with this so she recorded um, the voice on the track and then 15 of us from studio um, are backup dancers so we a good friend of mine who's a choreography um, choreographed a routine and as a studio we went to dance practice once a week for many months and um, and I, I find I'm so interested in this because I, I focused on lighting design really in order to uh, make this a career and to be able to fund some other projects that I wanted to do that are fairly outrageous and that nobody would say was a good idea. So it's kind of lovely to be able to sustain your own work so you don't really need to ask <laughs> if it's a good idea. And um, and also this idea of um, really, uh, I use that word immersion, and I mean that. I think that's what I've tried to do with chandeliers, but then to have the opportunity to take it further um, is just a huge privilege. So this set includes, um, I designed a rug and wallpaper and the sofa and the hand knotted throw and the day bed and then the chandeliers you might have seen before. Um, and uh, as well as costumes and jewelry. So this is an ear cuff you can see um, Ilya wearing, he's our CAD master. I mean, like people really went out and I was like, Ilya, can I put eyeliner on you? And he was like, no problem. <laughs> you know, it was like an amazing adventure all of us went through. And then this um, music video, this is another friend of mine. So we built a naughty bubble chandelier that could be swung on and climbed and um, through this process, it really pointed me into a direction of a new body of work that I wanted to refine and take through a proper product design iteration. And so um, here's some more pictures of us dancing. And this is one of the most finished pieces in the set. So this is a candelabra with these um, brass cast mushrooms, sort of shell fungus growing on them. and. And that piece really pointed to more work I wanted to make. So I'm taking this fungus language and applying it to these very overscale mirrors that have some illuminated elements on them, which are the circles. So they're similar to some of the chandeliers I've done. And um, these are getting fabricated in a totally different way than I've done before as well, which is really fun. We're, we're working with a supplier who makes frames for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So all of the forms are hand carved in wood and then they use traditional gold leafing. Um, and it was really beautiful to go to this space and understand the process more and then go back to my design and respond to a traditional process. And, um, and so it's a combination actually of wood and then casting some wood pieces in resin and then transitioning the resin to the form, which is 2D, to the frame. And then using vintage mirror, and then this one we're gonna do um, the, well actually, we're not sure if it's gonna be wax candles or oil lamps. We're experimenting with both right now. Um, and so, and this is a candelabra, again, with all of the fungus. I've done similar work to this before, but now I'm developing it into a five-foot long centerpiece for a table, and I, I love the, you know, drippy wax um, going all over the fungus, but it's all caught in this tray, so it won't ruin your 
$40,000 BD to dub at your table, which is usually what they're on. Um, and then here's some of the close-ups of jewelry, again, that we started out as prototypes and now we're developing it into proper refined pieces. And a lot of this video was about um, really looking at physical form and also the choreography to communicate this message of um, strict form and, and wild material. So a lot of the lighting has these very strict machine brass forms on them and then the glass slumps out of it and feels uncontrolled and the two things working together and the binding of the ropes and again the glass oozing out and having these gold kind of indulgences on them and that's a lot how I think about work. So the choreography and the storyline goes with this where um, they, these two parts, in a way, you know, it's like this, the strict formal part isn't, uh, doesn't shy away from the super wild, uncontrolled primal part. Like they can each give each other time um, to, uh, like time to have center stage, if that makes sense. So, um, so this theme continues through a lot of my work. And then we'll backtrack to 1996. <laughs> and this is the sculpture that I made at RISD. I took one semester off of industrial design and, um, and did sculpture. And in that time, I learned welding. And um, we had a foundry. I learned bronze casting. And it was really nice to step out of it because in ID, you're really trained to only consider mechanical connections and design for disassembly, which is invaluable. But and like welding was kind of a dirty word, <laughs> and um, and so just to switch around with departments and understand different things, to, I, I guess different reasons for making work first of all, and then what that form looks like and have it be fairly wide open. And it was also the first time that I had, um, I was an undergrad at RISD. It was my second undergrad degree, so we didn't have private spaces. But during this time, um, a friend of mine wasn't using his space. So it was the first time in my life that I had just a blank private room. And that um, process also led to very, very different work as opposed to work I was making when people could see what I was doing. So these were made out of nylons that um, I dunked in like a, I think it was a bucket of latex and then stretched um, stretched them over the frames that I had welded. And then we'll fast forward to, what year is this? 2001, I think. Um, and I owned a company called Butter with David Weeks after I worked for him for a year. And then he and I partnered and had this company for three years. And we really focused on um, simple origami driven paper forms. And he still manufactures his lampshade. It sells for $30 retail. And so we were really proud of um, pushing ourselves to come up with forms that we felt like were as elegant as as we could make them, but still keep the cost extremely low. Um, and other projects he and I did together were this design, this design vending machine that we had at the Javits Center during the ICFF in New York one year, and just commissioned, we didn't commission, we borrowed a lot of work from our friends and filled the vending machine, and so people could um, get a whole variety of um, different products. And then this is an installation with a little clip-on paper shade called Lunette. And, and I think doing an installation like this, which actually is still up, which is amazing in New York at this restaurant, um, it sort of pointed to the direction of what I wanted light to do, frankly, when I started installing these and then thinking about how you make, um, how you make that easy for someone. So, I often think about how one lives with the light to the electrician putting in the light to how it gets to the space to how I'm going to pack it and then that informs how you design the form to get light around a space. Um, and then this is, um, this is 10 minutes long without sound but it's a video that's a compilation of um, 
a lot of different videos that we've taken over time. So it's a nice visit to the studio. This is, this is my gallery space. I have a private gallery space and these pieces I did um, for a show in East Hampton. Um, we also have a ceramic studio. So um, these are really beginner works. I'm a real novice at ceramics and I have two people in my studio that are really know what they're doing. So they've um, taught me little by little how to experiment with, with porcelain mainly. And then this is um, a gold plated mussel shell. So these, these slides keep changing. So I'll, I'll just keep talking about um, some themes that work throughout my work. I'm putting on my glasses too so I can see what I wrote down. Um, so this idea though of getting points of light around a room and that being the end goal and then working backwards to how to use the um, smallest amount of material and the fewest number of components is something that I really put myself to the challenge. And so I'm always going back, um, looking, at, looking at nature and then coming back to like a very, um, a process that has, you think it has nothing to do with nature, I'll phrase it that way. And then you realize that, that nature's figured everything out before I got there. And so with a lot of my work, I, I frankly don't talk about it a lot because it doesn't occur to me. It's a funny thing, like sitting up here giving a talk about my work and actually gathering slides. I imagine there's a lot of people that make work to get out of speaking engagements. You know, it's kind of like you express yourself. You expect some, expect some really super deep, private, dark stuff about yourself through materials. That's like an amazing thing to do. And I think like some people are more comfortable, you know, expressing their feelings in metal rather than words. And I might be one of those people. So it's kind of like watching this, I think you might be able to pick up, um, to pick up some of that emotion, if that makes sense. I really enjoy using a lot of different materials and it's forced me to seek a deep understanding of different materials but I would not call myself a master of any craft at all. I, I, um, I love working with people that are such expertise in their area and like I work with a glass blower and her name is Michiko Sakano since, um, since 1999 we've been working together and it's anything that I give her, you know, she'll say, I don't know if I can do this, it is a challenge, but I'll try. And sort of the fact that she's got that approach and attitude, I would, there's no way I would be able to make what I do um, without having Michiko a really, really big part of it. And I would say that's true for all the materials that I work in. So it's almost like I would call myself a generalist and I connect the doc, dots and bring people together to um, have this really collaborative experience. And I get, I can visualize work very easily, but it's, um, it's never alone. I was thinking about that's something that talking to students about their work today and a lot of, and you're making projects independently, but after you leave school, that's pretty much the last time you'll ever make anything really solo. I'm pretty sure you always, you're always connected either to the outside world of who's collecting it or buying it or where it's going, or you're connected to the backstage world of who's helping you with the manufacturing or, or the shipping or the packing. Like there's so many constraints, and and I feel like um, that's that's such a how do I describe it like that's such a game in itself. Like that's something to, to focus on and become really good at in, it, in itself. And it's, it's not that much different than just being really, really nice to people, <laughs> but that's, um, it's definitely part of being uh, any kind of designer, I think. So um, these are the parts, these are the components. This is what my current studio looks like. This is the old studio, but you
But you can see how everything really packs down into a shoebox. So it's, you know, like a 10 foot long chandelier. Um, all the parts fit into a box this big. And my studio is divided up into five departments. And so we have a production department where there's about six people and they're building chandeliers to order and also to stock. And that includes custom orders and standard models. And then we have a pre-production department and that's all about prepping the parts and quality checking and um, managing the suppliers and then post-production. And that's all about catching every single last detail, catching all the paperwork, including wrapping it, but it's um, super detail oriented. And then we have a sales department and an accounting department. And, um, and again, none of us have a real, like a strong background in any of those things per se, but uh, we are a super tightly knit group and I make my process as transparent as I can for all my employees so that I can truly trust them. Like after a while, they, they can anticipate what I'm looking for. They can anticipate the question that I would ask and they get there first um, and take care of it. So, so that's also been like a fascinating thing to look at my business as an art project in a way, looking at it as, um, like the most creative project out of everything. It's way, has way more facets to it than a chandelier will ever have because it's, yeah, it's real people and it's, um, and um, you can do so much more with the business than you can with a light fixture. So let's see, this has a few more minutes. We have, a small um, machine shop set up where we prototype parts, but we only do um, prototyping and testing and like a couple one-off parts um, on the, it's like a milling machine lathe combo and we don't do any production of parts in our studio. We always use a outside supplier um, and everything's made in the United States. So you can see how the materials we use are pretty wide ranging, but they, I think that there's a, a thread that goes through everything in terms of the sensibility and the way we combine hardware with um, really organic forms. And I really am interested in making work uh, that doesn't look too self-conscious, which which is a huge challenge and continues to be a challenge, but I'm finding that you can get completely enraptured by like a little mushroom and you look at the crystalline structure and it's just like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And the mushroom has no idea <laughs> that it's so amazing to look at. And I, and I think that that's such a hard thing to do in product design, but that's really what I try to get at. Oopsies. I thought maybe that was the end. Is it repeated or no? I guess it's in there twice. And I would also say like the really challenging yet fun thing um, about working for yourself is that, did this repeat? <laughs> is it the same thing? Okay. Is that it gives you a chance to revisit work and to continue a thread, even if you started it five years ago. Um, and that for me has been enormously gratifying. I never feel like I've arrived at a form that's perfect or that's finished. 
ever. And so I love making systems because I love that feeling of like the dot, dot, dot after it. It's kind of sometimes very painful to deliver a final piece because when if you're at a crit or you're at an exhibition, all you're thinking is what you would do differently, what you want to do next, how that just opened a door up to what you really want to do. And um, so that's like something I'm really grateful for in running my own studio. This is some work um, that I made with David Weeks from Butter. So there's just two slides. And you can kind of see the beginnings of what I was doing. Um, but again, we wanted like there to be um, super minimal hardware, everything exposed. And then some more origami forms. And then we'll fast track to now. So this is um, a drawing of a piece that I'm making for the show in Milan. And I work with a gallery called Nilafar. And they um, have, the way that works is they have exclusives on two of my collections. And so it's a different circuit than I show the rest of my work in, which is um, all the art fairs and um, Salone. So this cage is, um, it's nearly six feet in diameter. And then all of these little hand, these represent little hand blown glass globes that are rolled in um, gold foil. And they vary from like three inches to five inches. And here's another form that's probably like five feet in diameter. So my studio is um, frantically making these right this second while I'm standing here. <laughs> and we have to get these out the door at the end of the month. And then this is a system that I'm developing further. It's called Marina. And the way we made this is um, it's a 3D printed coral form. And then we had it electroplated in copper and then plated to match our other hardware after that. And so what I'm doing now is developing the form so that I can, um, so that electrical wires can travel through the coral forms, and we're doing some tests with CNCing um, polycarbonate and corian, and then finishing those surfaces. And again, what I really want to do with this is have any electrician anywhere in the world who speaks any language know what to do when they open up the box. And um, so I'm really pushing that this very pretty complicated form, this is like, I guess, 48 inches in diameter can be as easy to mount as any flush mounted fixture. And then this is some of my studies. So I do a lot of a lot of drawing, a lot of gouache painting, and this is big. This is I guess 40 inches tall, 30, something like that. I think it's 40 inches tall. And um, sometimes when you just draw something very literally, it's almost like an exercise. I wouldn't call this art, I would call it more like a study, but just because it's so time intensive, it does make me feel like I understand the structure more, feel closer to it. Um, it's in a way like your body, your body learns it more than uh, like you get your head out of the way. I think that's a little bit of my process. And then I'll just show you some other forms that um, is all in the current body of work. This is called branching chain light. And I was pushing this concept because I was really interested in getting beyond the constraints of what a single stem could allow me. I couldn't get the wingspan I wanted to on a chandelier. There's only so far you can go before metal wants to move. So then I really thought about, I want it to look super effortless. I don't want it to feel like it's it's stretching. So then just started playing with thinking about multiple points around the room and just like in a super, super easy way. So taking, um, you know, small sections of the, the branching armature that I use in most of my work and then just adding some chain through it. So I feel like I've just sort of scratched the surface with this one. This is pretty recent. And then again, like taking some other pieces that we've done and doing iterations um, of them and adding um, gold foil and hand-blown glass spikes and metal spikes and these little glass barnacles. Um, this is a piece I did. Um, and again, it combines all these languages, but it's quite fun to work with the same interior design clients multiple times because 
when they come back in to order something, they can really customize my work in a really wonderful way. I would never, I would have never made this piece on my own, but it's like it's quite nice when they come to you and they give you the dimensions they're going for, and um, you know they push. They really do push me. A lot of my clients and. And also in, a, in the way that you don't think you can make something, and then you do, and um, and then you know most of these we never make again. Um, same with this. This is for uh, this is in London. It's called Somerset House, and it's this incredible building. And so, the way we made this one, um, it has 19 globes, and I think the footprint is 20 by 20 feet. And so we designed it with five um, points that it attaches on the ceiling, and it ships in five crates. So again, it was our design challenge to do um, really technical yet simple drawings of how an electrician could connect um, each section and mount it to the ceiling. And it went really well, but it was... It was a challenge, and now I would like to do more work like this where it really feels like the chandelier is kind of completely taking over. We do a lot of stairwell pieces, and then this shows an example of how we're using porcelain in chandeliers. Um, this is another image of a custom installation of a simple light that we did, which just, um, we source all of these clamps from all over the United States that are, that, um, I think we get them on eBay, I'm pretty sure. And then we have them plated in brass. And then the glass blower, um, you know, smushes the glass. And it becomes this slumped form that's cut and polished on the end. And again, I really pay attention to what, um, when you look at material, how it makes you feel. So I'm super interested in, like, that heaviness and the drippiness. And, like, you're aware of gravity, but you can see through it. So it has, like, this visual lightness. This is um, a custom order for Naughty Bubbles and this home is incredible. It sort of juts out over the Hudson River and and so there are these, this thing is so heavy and um, and then I'll show you some inspiration behind this piece. So this is manufactured by Roland Hill who's based in Brooklyn. So they manufacture three of my designs and they also work with Michiko Sakano, the glass blower. And so the way that these are made is she blows into um, a metal wire cage and it makes these indents and then the cage comes off and then it goes into the annealer and it's cut and polished and then um, the rope replaces where the cage was. And this is this disgusting image that I've like carried around for 10 years. I have a lot of stuff like this that I collect. So a lot of times my inspiration comes to comes from a place that's like more extreme than I would want to make somebody feel. But I know I responded to it, so I um, I keep it. And then and then you begin to understand certain theories behind physics or laws, I should say, and then it all starts making sense of how this um, visceral feeling that you can't even really pinpoint necessarily of tension connects with something that happens every day that might be on a microscopic level and then you start putting them together. This is another image that I've saved for a long time and it's greatly influenced a number of projects including Naughty Bubbles and then this other one I'll show in a little while and again it's just that t that tension I love and that grabbing and the aggressiveness and you know how do you how do you translate um, this claw with trash into a luxury object I find it I find it interesting challenge here's a beautiful space this is one of um, the first chandeliers I did and here's another example of the porcelain chandelier. This is a custom piece for um, the Peninsula Hotel in New York. There's a restaurant there. Um, and we go through so many iterations of, of figuring out form. And I love doing this. I mean, I think if I didn't have to finish things, I never would. I'm really attached to process. And... 
I find so much joy in it. I love that there's no ending. And um, it's good that there is endings, um, to It's, um, in a way, not even because there's a final finished piece, but just because it pushes the creative process to the next level when you have to deliver. And that's been really excellent for me. Here's the beginning of uh, a development for a whole collection called Agnes, but it started out as this sketch, um, really like chicken scratch kind of sketch. And then on the right is me kind of Frankensteining it together with parts I have. And a lot of times that's how I work. You want to go quickly one-to-one -one, and it can look ugly, but you know what you want it to look like. So all these little elbow joints and tubes and I don't think those are candles. I think it's like tape and paper. And then that gets translated into distilling that down to the smallest number of units. And then that gets um, turned into a product. And this, this product has evolved since 2009 to now. So now I'm still working on it and I'm just launching the new versions of Agnes Chandelier in Milan. Um, and I, I really love that way of working, of letting it take its own time. Um, I hear some other, I'll just show you some other examples of mostly branching bubble chandeliers. This is at um, ICA in Boston. And this is the, this is Catch Collection um, that we make for Nilafar Gallery as well. They have they show this, um, they did an exhibition in Paris, that's where this is from, and we developed this sconce so that the LEDs are in the little brass strip, so the assembly has become super streamlined. At the beginning it was really complicated, and so I love the fact that the glass is empty, and I'm trying to make more work with, with that, so there's real, it's just a, it's just a volume. Anytime you look in there, there's nothing in there, but the whole thing's illuminated. I'm really pushing to do more of that. We made some other um, wall lights with five lights. And, um, and there's a chandelier version. So that's, in, that's at the gallery. And, and I think I make work with somebody in mind very often. So the owner of this gallery, her name is Nina Yashar and she pushes me. She's, um, she's been in the business since 1979. She knows what she's talking about. She has an incredible collection of vintage pieces, probably 5,000 pieces, many of them just one-off masterpieces. And she asks very direct questions. She's very funny, um, very forthright. And I think in a way, like since I graduated from RISD in 1996, like she's been the, the teacher I found. And I, I was craving it. And it's so... It's, um, it's a real gift. You have to be able to take it, but it's like, it's a real gift. Like the original canopy for this one, she looked at and she was like, it is terrible. And I was like, no, I know, I know. And so we could just like sit there, which we do very spontaneously. I'll just spend a, a pen and I'll just like quickly sketch, quickly sketch. And she's just, you know, right there saying what's not maybe terrible. And then, and then it becomes a real thing. And I, I just um, adore that process. Um, here's some more examples of just using the same kit of parts and spikes and globes to make different shapes. And here's that like garbage dump thing. Oh, I put the garbage dump thing in twice. That's funny, it's coming up again. Um, I really like that garbage. Um, so this is done for a company called Quadrat who does gorgeous fabrics. And so they have an exhibition, um, a few every year actually, where they invite designers to be a part of it. And we got to use this just gorgeous, um, saturated, the colors were amazing and to slice it and play with it. And then I made these porcelain um, barnacle shapes all glowing. So I think that's like maybe 30 inches in diameter. And that's a piece I'll probably go back to and rework. But when I did it, like the, you know, the demand for it was zero. So it hasn't really like pushed me to make more, but I am interested. I'll probably push myself. It's funny that way. I think that when you do, when you are, um, you know, when you are in, 
business, you your work ends up following a path because people are ordering it, but it might not be your first choice. So it's always good to like have that time to check in, to think, well, what do I really want to push forward? You're not always following um, what people are wanting. It's, um, it's a hard thing, though. And then this was for Issei Winfield, this gorgeous restaurant. And here's another beautiful home in Tribeca, and one in the Hamptons. Stairwells. So it was, it, was, um, it was quite fun to realize that we could make so many things with these kind of like high-end tinker toys. <laughs> and then uh, those shades are these little hammered shades around a um, small halogen bulb. This is a collection called Series, which I did um, for Matter, which is a store in New York. This is an exclusive series. It was a limited edition, and I cast um, lots of parts from nature and put in like um, walnut dowels, and then cast parts of like man's interpretation of nature. So like Lego plants, I cast in brass, and then um, wanted to really play with the way light shown onto glass rather than um, through glass. And this is another piece from that collection. And I think when you make work that is larger than yourself, you do um, imagine it as a body. And I really think about that a lot. Like you can feel the gesture and I love like, I love awkward tension and um, you know, things not feeling like too comfortable. Here's another project for Matter um, called Nick and the Candlestick, where the candles are sort of stabbed on there, and then the, the tray um, catches all the wax. And some more porcelain work. And again, I, this piece I would have never thought of doing if a client didn't say, like, what, you know, what could you come up with if I pushed you to go dark? And so this, um, we used a black um, porcelain clay body, and it's, we've never made one again, but I liked how it turned out. And then this is where Agnes is today. So this one's called Swarm. And um, using essentially the exact same units that we used at the beginning. And um, the glass is made in Poland. It's a really different process than we use um, in Brooklyn. Roland Hill ma manufactures this. And then we just slice the ends of the glass. So I'm launching, I think it's like four new iterations um, next month. And I'm also really interested in doing, um, again, like more immersive work. So it's fun to think about how these chandeliers can travel around a room. And more um, iterations of Naughty Bubbles. And here's a product that we're going to launch um, in June with one stem rather than three. This is a lot of how work um, comes out of our studio, where someone will commission something, and we figure out how to fill the order. But then in order to make it an actual product, we'll push ourselves to have it hang from one stem because it's, um, it's really difficult to get three stems parallel. So we just don't want to put that burden on an electrician. And this is the Cherry Bomb series. So it's all these tiny little hand-blown glass globes with um, gold foil and pink with gold foil. And then this was the, the installation at Design Miami this year with Nilafar. This is Catch Floor Light, so that's the... Um, the floor light version of the slumpy glass you saw at the Milan show. And these are called Totem. So this is a limited collection. And they, it sort of uses like every trick in my bag. <laughs> so it's sort of like layers of working with my favorite glass artist, Nancy Callen, who lives in Seattle, who does all these incredible grid um, 
effects on globes with cane work, and we did ceramic and wood, and um, these were really, really fun to make. And these are an exclusive to the Future Perfect. These are the gold muscle shells. So you can kind of see that I like, as a practice, I exist in many different categories of selling to stores, making small product, making jewelry, selling some exclusives to design galleries. Like I never really made a decision about which or what to do. It's sort of like the project um, takes on a life of its own in a way. And then I, I make sort of, I make decisions when it's time, but I never really do too early. And this shows um, a lot of the process. It's not unlike studio at all here, where you're really mocking something up. You're getting the idea out there. I'm using plastic globes in lieu of glass. And I often um, go to a construction site if it's a new piece. And the client, everyone weighs in, you know, the client, the homeowner, the architect, the lighting specialist, the nanny, the children, like whoever's home like has an opinion. <laughs> and then you, you get through this stage and then um, you make the thing for real and all the finished uh, materials and the glass goes on and it's really fun to watch the whole apartment to go together. I love being like one piece in a giant puzzle and the interior designer has the vision. It's it's super amazing feeling. Um, and then that's the end product. And this designer um, is Kelly Wurstler who's based in LA and she was really she was great to work with because she is super curious about everything in the studio um, and really pushed me, you know, why can't we put a spike on the chandelier? Like, I know they're different products, but like, and so again, like sometimes an outside voice who has a client and a deadline really pushes you to begin to combine things in a way you never have. And I really love that. And here's another apartment, again, doing the mock-up in the space and then the final when everything comes together. This is the um, Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner. And then I just have a couple slides that shows a little bit about, um, you know, again, like going back to nature and seeing that everything else was there and the way the relationship of bubbles and then not only looking at the outside form, but then looking at the inside form and how they're connected and then getting into that. And, you know, that points to the structure of the armatures and looking for minimal path systems and you know what is the most efficient way of getting energy around a space. And cracks, like all the angles repeat so often in nature and scale and um, there's Michiko working. And more machine parts. Um, this is what the first ones look like. So this article came out in 2006 and this was when I made the first one and it really looked like like plumbing. It looked like the like underside of a sink or something flying in the sky with glass. And, um, and those parts are what we started with. So those are like available lamp parts. And so like little by little by little, I've had a chance to redesign every single component. And here's some more shots of studio. And here's the gang. So this is in um, the gallery space I have. And I'm also producing two collections by Mary Wallace, who's a designer that works for me. And her chandeliers are on the left in that slide. They're called E. And so we're going to show um, at the Javits Center. I have a booth to show only her work. She's in the center with the red dress, super talented. And then um, as part of studio, I offer each employee a workshop. So Barrett and Kevin went to Iceland to study neon. And um, so each, each employee can choose wherever they want to go every year. And then they come back and give a slideshow to the whole staff. And so it's amazing because you get to really like go on their journey with them and learn a lot. I think that we're a group that's so curious and so interested in so many different things and um, really love to travel, but you, yeah, you have to go to work. So it's been amazing. This is Sasha. She went to Bois Boucher and studied um, with um, Philip Moulin. And so I showed these slides because it's been, again, like really fun to invent what, what a company looks like. And 
Um, there's so many choices of how to run things and how to treat people and what the day is structured like and what the hours are like and what lunch looks like. And um, so I really, I really try to be thoughtful um, about all of that. And it really ends up, you know, like being so synergistic, I have to say. Like they bring their whole selves to the table every day at, at work. And it's, um, and they really weigh in, you know, I love getting their honest feedback. I think there's a lot of trust there, mutual trust. Um, and then the other thing my company does, where you know, because we make work, the way we do it sort of dictates the the industry it's in, which is luxury level. It's a, you know, it ends up being a price after you just calculate your wholesale price and then calculate your retail price. That a very small percentage, really, of the world ends up can can buy, and that's just. Um, something I've accepted about what I'm doing because of the way I manufacture things. And so what I've chosen to do, I've, I've often thought about, should I really push myself to make a super affordable light? And then I'm like, what is that about? And, you know, I, I instead prefer to use the company to support people that are actually doing something for social change. So, um, and then, so what we do is, I guess I started like four years ago, I've really committed um, every year to supporting Robin Hood Foundation, um, which is in New York City, which really helps families and individuals get out of poverty and become, you know, find a stable life. And they start helping women, like even when they're, bef you know, before they've had a baby. So like when they're just three months pregnant, they have the help then to understand um, health and childcare, et cetera. It's a really wonderful organization. So that's been, um, it's been a really, like a huge motivator, frankly. I think that a lot of creative people can feel uneasy about money and about charging anything for your work because your process is so separate from money. It's so pure. It's like, um, I've never really met one creative person that didn't feel a bit stumped when it comes to how much to charge. But the idea of, of like being motivated by being in a place of generosity, like that is... Um, you know, that, that like really drives, that, like that drives a lot of what I do, I'd say. And then I just have a few slides and then a five minute um, music video that I made. Again, this just shows some like other installations and some of the inspiration work behind it. But you can see the themes and the processes, I think. So it's a lot of things coming full circle. And then this one has audio. Should I wait for the... Oh, thank you. Um, so this video I made about, um, how many years ago? About four years ago. And it combines um, some of the same themes of like adorning the body and adorning the interior and moving from inside space to outside space and thinking about like creating kind of this like utopian world of crafters.
you.